Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to this. See, I mean, something that we are beginning today is a conversation on libraries, the relevance of libraries, the transformative role that it used to play, and that role which we need to probably reinvent today. And we have uh, seminal uh, stakeholders here who is on the stage and also attending the program. We've also uh, did not try and look at this as a domain-centric exercise, but try to involve various stakeholders which we think should come into uh, what we broadly understand as library movement. Uh, that's one reason why we invited Sanjoy Roy, who will be able to talk about his journey, I mean, lessons from his journey of conducting various literature festivals, creating conversations on various topics. Uh, we also have Mridula Koshi, who will be, who is a who is a key uh, force behind the community library project and a, a, a huge inspiration for uh, us to do this. The kind of work that she does uh, with Michael and her wonderful team, uh, catering to a membership of about three thousand five hundred uh, members uh, in. Uh, in three libraries in different parts of the city, and a, and, a, and a certain kind of model that is really inspiring. It's not just a library, it's it's much more. And uh, so we have uh, Mridula, we have Sanjoy, and uh, we are also joined by librarians, library-based uh, professionals uh, who are uh, part of the audience. We thank you for your participation, and all of you who made time. Let me uh, welcome uh, all the three of them and request Saini to please take this forward. Saini is director of Duckbill Books. I'm sure she's a familiar face to many of you. May I invite her to please take this forward? Okay. So first I want to ask all of you, because I, of course, after Sachin contacted me, I had moments of severe introspection. How many of you have been to a library if you work in a library, that doesn't count. How, how many of you have been to a library for pleasure in the last six months? Last six months. That is very impressive. As you saw, my hand was firmly down. <laughs> okay. um, so we all grew up with this idealistic notion of libraries as a place where we all want to be. But many of us live in spaces where there are no libraries to go to for pleasure. And when Sachin spoke about this series, his whole idea was that we have a free-flowing discussion because none of us really know, well, we know where we want to end up with libraries which are available and accessible to all of us, but we don't quite know how to go there, get there. And what has happened is while India started off, as in many other aspects, with an extremely idealistic notion of what the public library system was going to be. Um, it doesn't exist. The new development which we've been seeing in the past few years is that there have been a number of private players who have entered corporates, literature festivals, individuals who believe in the cause of libraries, who have banded together or are doing interesting things parallelly, which help to bring books to people. Um, I have to say, as a children's publisher, um, and Mridula, as custodian of a libra library primarily for children, our focus will possibly veer there a bit. Um, when I was reading up in preparation for this session, I think one of the, sorry, one of the things uh, which I was very impressed by was the uh, vision of libraries which was laid down at the time, well, before independence, and the whole notion of libraries as a public space which is accessible to all, which is reader-centric, which is where the needs of the reader determine the collection, uh, which is not often an experience that we see in community or public libraries if we can find them. So first, I'd like to ask Mridula, how did you guys start? Because what you have done in the past few years is nothing short of phenomenal. Okay, hello everybody. Um, how did we start? Um, I think it's really important to stress that lots of 
us are working together to do this. So this isn't, um, our, our story is not the story of uh, a few phenomenal people doing something phenomenal. Um, in fact, the story is um, mostly about our members. Um, and the reason um, I emphasize this is because they have not been emphasized enough. Um, the ordinary person, the working class person in India is not uh, welcome in literature. So my own personal beginning in this um, and how I came to be in a space where people are welcomed, people who have been excluded are welcomed, is that I was a writer for a number of years. I spent around 10 years writing three books and grappled the entire time with trying to reach an audience I couldn't reach. And at least one of the important things, uh, conclusions that I drew from that 10 year experience is that libraries are needed for books to find readers and that books have no value and writing has no value without readers. So um, then I met lots of people who said things like, um, people don't read anymore and it took some uh, further amount of time to realize that the word people is only covering a very tiny minority of Indians. And the vast majority of people who live in India, um, even just that, that sentence that, you know, um, people don't read anymore, um, lets us know when we examine it that already we are excluding. Many people have never been given a chance to read. Um, yes, um, our statistics for educating people have only gotten better and better over the years. The literacy rate in India is just uh, steadily been increasing over the last decades. But um, what we are doing in our school system is inviting people to a functional kind of literacy, which um, probably has very strong connections with our ambitions for our GDP, for our workforce, for having an educated workforce, for being able to present ourselves in the world and so on. But when we go back to the sentence, people don't read anymore. Oh, it's so sad that people don't read anymore. Um, people are not being seen. Many, many people who are only allowed this kind of functional literacy uh, are completely left out of the equation. If we create a public library system in India, it would be successful only if we first examine who we mean by people. After that, we can have the kind of library system that I think when you started by talking about you know, the idealistic um, visions we've all of us perhaps had, uh, ideas about spaces where everyone is welcome, ideas about spaces where because everyone is welcome, ideas are exchanged and um, thinking, powerful thinking can happen. Um, we can get to that. Part of what we do in the Community Library Project is really um, contend with the politics of exclusion by working proactively to include. And I can talk more about that whenever it's appropriate to do that. But it's so important in this room and in every room where people gather to talk about literature and where people gather to talk about the importance of libraries, we start by acknowledging that we have trouble seeing people. We have trouble seeing. And because we don't see people, because only some people get to be people, we have ended up um, some 70 years after independence with a handful of libraries limping along and a lot of bemoaning about why people aren't reading. So unlike libraries where no one wants to be seen, literature festivals are where everyone wants to be seen. So how can we get those people into more libraries or inspiring more libraries? I'm, all, I'm actually going to try and answer, I'll come to the answer a little later. I'm going to just react perhaps first to Mridula and thank you Habitat for putting together this session which I think is primary. You know, as a kid in the late 60s where we didn't have distraction of television and it was primarily only black and white and you went to the Delhi Gymkhana, you spent your life 
or we certainly as kids when we were in in Delhi uh, and came back later, came back to India, spent our lives in the Delhi Gymkhana Library, which in many ways shaped uh, certainly a, a kind of people, as you said. Um, 30 years ago, one of the hats that I wear, you know, because I have long hair, as many of you know, I wear many hats, not because I know much, but because I have the hair. Uh, one of the trusts that I, that I was part of setting up was for street children, Salam Balak Trust. And these are kids who run away from home. They're, they're not literate uh, necessarily. And we were trying to find ways to be able to cross that bridge or cross that divide. And uh, to our wonderment, actually, uh, a Preeti Paul and the Oxford bookstore in, over the last uh, half a decade or a decade has now created libraries in each of our homes for these children. Um, the, the issue then became, what do we populate the libraries with? How many kids' books or pictorial books or books in different languages were accessible because we get kids from across India? So that became the first challenge. How do you, how do you look at that? When it comes to literature festivals, I think you know, one of the things that the literature festival perhaps has done um, has made books sexy in a sense, or certainly, I mean, not everybody comes for the books, as we know, they come for the Domino pizzas or the food or for the selfie and for the merchandising, and some of them stay back. We still sell about 100,000 books in Jaipur over five days. Across the world, um, and we work very closely with a number of library systems. We work with the Toronto Public Library System, which is the largest in the world. In Boulder, JLF works uh, is situated in the JLF, in the Boulder Public Library. And I remember the first time when we went there, uh, Shaini, I was stunned to see that the majority of people using the library were people with mental uh, 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 illness and people from the street. And they came into the library on a cold winter morning, the minute the library opened, used its facilities, and then used the library in whatever way it did. And it got me thinking, certainly, and certainly asking the question, so who are we doing this for? And it goes back again to a time with Salam Bala Trust, where one of our first centers was in the public municipal library in Paharganj, uh, just opposite the railway station. And I remember getting into an altercation with the librarian there once who said, Aapke bache gande hai, to make sure that they don't drink from our water cooler because people who are visiting the library will not then drink from the water cooler and you know you have to find a way. We're happy to give you a space outside in the porch, but they can't That's use perfect. the facilities. And I kept saying, but these are kids and we are using your space so they can act, get access to books. In all of this, I think, where we, I think there's a coming together is that as more and more literature festivals, the world over, not just in India, India now has 133 odd literature festivals and supposedly 333 sort of owe their, their, uh, their, uh, their inspiration from uh, the Jaipur Literature Festival. Um, I think the world over, one of the things that we need to do is work closely in those cities with the libraries to see how, how can we make both these ends meet in some way. And the moot question here is, when you said, have you visited a library in the last six months, I think you need to also qualify, is it a brick and mortar library? Is it a Sahapedia? Is it Google uh, uh, Culture uh, uh, Lab? I mean, what do we now define a library to be? And what is that receptacle that contains this knowledge and information? It has changed from our time where you know, you, you, you look at a hard copy of, of, of a published work like you have in the American Congress or the Parliament uh, uh, Library. And there has been instances, Ravi DC, for example, down south, has been working closely across the length and breadth of Kerala through his bookstores and the local library to be able to find a synergy. Again, I go back to, given the book, the brick and mortar nature of real estate and library and warehousing and Amazon and Google and a whole new world. I think we ourselves first have to address the issue that what is that library today? What 
does that library have to offer? How do we make that library accessible to those people who we are saying, not necessarily only people like us who have access to phones and therefore the internet and therefore all of these other places, but those kids who don't have access. Uh, at, in a run-up to Jaipur, we reach out to about 120 schools between Delhi and Jaipur, and these are schools who wouldn't necessarily have access to us. So we send our, writer, our, our speakers or writers or people who do workshops to them because we know that they come from economically less privileged areas and they don't have that facility of, of having a library available. Why do we send the speakers? So that we can instill in both the teachers and the students a love of learning and a love of knowledge and most importantly, a love of inquiry. Somewhere along that, along the course of the thing, our, we know that our education system has stymied that in many ways and has not allowed you to want to research, to want to know, to be inquisitive if you aren't going to be any of those three things, and that was something I think that our childhoods were full of. Go out and be inquisitive because you weren't being bombarded 24 into seven. You weren't being pushed messages all the time. You had to go out and do that. So I think that's changed. And I think before we move on, we need to understand some of that context and how perhaps you, through your library systems and through reaching out to these people, have been able to change that to some extent and how vital it is today to catch kids especially, get them onto that, uh, the, the routine of being able to read by themselves, wanting to read by themselves, not because it's a, it's a chore that's being put out by parents or teachers or whatever, but just the joy of reading that, you know, even today I, I don't have a television in our, in our bedroom and I prefer to read. Uh, then I, or on a flight, I prefer to read rather than watch television. I may have lost out of Netflix and everything else, but I'm quite happy uh, reading my books. Um, okay, brick and mortar, um, and what have we done in our library? So if we go back to who gets to read in India um, and who has been left out, I'm not saying that uh, the question of... Uh, um, digital access and books and e-books being available um, on the net doesn't impact the scene. It definitely does. It especially does so um, in the middle class and in the upper classes. Um, working class children have access to mobile phones, sometimes not for, and especially the younger you are, uh, the less likely you are to have access. Uh, so what we found out when we opened our library is that there are a lot of children with a lot of free time in Delhi. And they don't know where to go, and they don't feel safe. And having a place where you are allowed to come and you don't have to have a rationale for coming in, your parents haven't enrolled you, um, nobody is saying, um, what are you doing here? Uh, that, that yourself is your own justification and it's enough justification means that um, the numbers that Sione cited are real. Um, five years ago, we opened the door, January 2015, to um, uh, the community and we said it's free and it's open to all. And mostly four, five, six, and seven-year-olds walked in on their own. Parents did not bring them in. Nobody enrolled them. They enrolled themselves. In the last five years, we've developed a whole range of best practices to address these children and to make it possible for them to enter reading. Um, they are not, we are not competing with them anyway. When we, the, the people we serve, um, we do not compete for their attention. Um, the need for a safe space, libraries, the best libraries all over the world provide that. At this moment in time, there's a lot of debate in the tiny world of um, people who think about reading in India, various organizations, you know, Room to Read, Read India, Pratham, uh, the literature festivals, um, writers as individuals, writers collectively, um, the Indian Cultural Forum. We're all thinking about reading. We're actually very, very small because this is a huge, huge country. Um, but in that tiny world, there is quite a schism right now 
there are people who are arguing for a digital solution to the lack of libraries in this country. So there's a national uh, mission on libraries. It was constituted some decade ago or so. And uh, if you go to their website, they have identified around um, uh, 50,000, 60,000, 70,000 libraries. They are very clear that they don't know if these libraries are actually libraries. Um, they have asked the people to. Is quite hilarious. Yes, they've asked people to register their libraries in Indi in in Delhi. I think a few dozen libraries are registered, maybe just a dozen. Um, if you click through those who have registered, they're study spaces. Um, some of them, you know, the questions are like, how many books are in your collection? Many people don't answer the question. Um, we can guess why. A few who do answer the question answer it with uh, 20 books or 35 books. And uh, the few that provide images of their libraries, it's very clear that, you know, and it's 1,000 rupees a month or 650 rupees a month to join. You join for three or four months while you're preparing for an exam, and it's a space you go to study. That is really important, and we should have that. I'm not at all arguing against that, but that's not a library. So you know, a country of like 1.3 billion people, and we think we have around 50,000 libraries, but we're really not sure. In the national capital, like a dozen people have registered that they have libraries, and a few dozen others there are. The Delhi public library system itself has about three dozen branches. Um, it's not enough for the around 20, 20 million people who live in this, in this city. So on the one hand, there are no libraries. On the other hand, people say the solution to this is to deliver a story a day on your phone which you made an eloquent argument for why we shouldn't be putting that in people's, especially in little children's hands, because I, I actually am a very poor reader now, and I was an amazing reader once upon a time. I'm a poor reader because I'm very distractible, um, because I use these devices. We know this is really bad for children. We shouldn't do that, just for that reason alone. But I want to tell you one um, other and, and very specific to India reason. Brick and mortar bookstores and books you can hold in your hand are really important because if you have been excluded from reading for generations and your father didn't read and your mother didn't read and your grandparents didn't read and once upon a time some of them tried and they were actually told on pain of death that they shouldn't and couldn't read and you know of examples of people who have been punished like bodily harm for trying to read, then you cannot read alone. You need a space where you are welcome, where you can pick up a book, and you can notice that other people who have preceded you have come in and have picked up books. Um, one very um, uh, effective, but a better word would be lovely, thing we do in our libraries. We have an honor roll of readers. When you read 10 books in our library, we applaud. We put your name up on the wall um, on a big, long roll of paper. In the branch at which I'm located, um, in Sheikh Sarai, we have, I think, somewhere in the region of uh, 1,400, um, someone in the audience from our library can correct me on this, uh, people who have read at least 10 books. Many of them have read 100 or more books because after you read 10 more, you get another star and you get another one. But the important thing is, if you are the 1,331st child and your name goes up there, you know that there were 1,330 people who did this. And you know that perhaps this means you can do it too. And we cannot deliver that on an app. I mean, aside from the fact that it would be really, really poisonous for children to have to look at a phone to read a book, um, there is the fact that, uh, you know, as a middle class person who did some amount of reading in public libraries growing up, because I was lucky enough to be next to one of the few in this city, um, I, I uh, love to be alone inside a book. But um, children who come to our library don't love being alone inside a book they feel crushed by the experience. They feel like it cannot be done. And I think they resemble more people in India than I resemble people in India. So we need, we need um, authors to go to neighborhoods that they normally don't go to. I have been at the JLF um, festival and watched that whole parallel thing going on where 
people are going out into the community. And that's, it's, it's really important that JLF does what it does and that at the community library project we do what we do. It's important because it's a challenge to everybody who says it can't be done or that those kids to whom you send the writers won't be interested, that it'll be a waste on them. I have been in settings where people have said to me, ye log or padenge? And it's, 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 it, it's in everyone's mind every day when we say things like, oh, people have stopped reading. We've, we've just left out, ye log. Ye log nahi padenge. But it's, it's not true. We opened the library, and in short order, we had 600 people. Another year went by, and it was around 1,200. We've been picking up like 600 people a year. It's like wave after wave after wave of people come in, and they want to be on that honor roll, and they want to read books. They want to meet writers. So best practices in our library are all about welcoming writers to come in and talk to kids, because writers know that they're nothing without readers. Um, Writers who come to our library typically end up changing their entire presentation when they see who they're talking to, and often for the better. Um, Manglesh Tabral came in and he looked at like rows of women sitting on the ground with like their heads covered, and he started with a poem about his mother. So, um, and he talked about famine, and he talked about eating bichu grass in the hills. And I don't think that's what he talked about when he was at the Habitat Center or at IIC. So this broadening of who we think of as people will force us to meet um, their need. And these small efforts in the, in the face of a large country, efforts like what we're doing in the library or what the literature festivals are about, these efforts are important because they're very provocative. And we want them to be provocative because as a country we need to be um, challenged. You know, We're not a poor country. Kerala does it. We can afford it. I mean, it, it costs very little, actually. And what's happened in the news today, what's happened in Kashmir today, tells us that even those of us who are that narrow slice of people who hardly resemble most of the people in this country, we badly need everyone to have access to information and everyone to enter the conversation. And these provocations, I hope, see, we cannot, um, we cannot be what the country has to do. There just aren't enough festivals and enough bands of citizens doing free community libraries to which 2,000, 3,000 people come. What we really need is a publicly owned library system that is open to everyone, and it shouldn't be a study space. So you know, these sorts of provocations help people define and understand the political, um, the lay of the land. And then all those practices, like authors meeting all kinds of children, these are best practices. The honor roll program is a best practice. Free membership and open to everyone. No, um, some, some very nice libraries that I know where very good people are trying really hard to do the right thing, do things like, um, what is it called? Like le you pay less, you take less books, you pay more, you take more books. Um, that's not okay, that's not a best practice. Uh, and they've said things to me like, but, uh, and they even have free for some people. Um, so if you pay 2,000 rupees, you can borrow two books at a time. If you're free, you can take one book at a time. Uh, this is not good because the person who is free, even if they are anonymous to everyone else, they know they're free in a system in which other people are not. So that's not part of the warm welcome and the undoing of centuries of exclusion that we need to aim for. So um, I, I'm sorry, I'm going on. I'll stop and let you prod us in a new direction because there's a lot of ground to cover and we won't probably do it all today, but. Okay, prod one. Um, I'm, I'm less ambiguous, I'm less close to the idea of digital libraries simply because people don't have access to books. And um, I want to talk in particular about one project, the Pratham Story Weaver project. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. They do excellent picture books in multiple languages, and they're free. Now, for me, the catch, do you know? Of they're just 
some of the best picture books being published in the country today. Now the catch with that is that the only people who I know who use it are people who can afford to buy the books. So the target audience, the people who cannot afford to buy books, and, and the books are readable, I mean, you don't need a very sophisticated phone, you don't need very good quality um, high-speed Wi-Fi to access it, but the kids for whom it's intended are not using it. I work with a couple of government schools in Delhi, and you know when I show the teachers that the teachers start using it, and, and they love it. But the thing is, how do we also get information about things which are accessible and free out? Ideas? Ideas? Well, you know, one is if we stop mistrusting or distrusting each other, i.e. government and the non-not-for-profit sector and the NGO sector who's been working in doing that last mile link, that can be one step because the minute you do that, government can use its vast resources to get information out. The last mile connectivity that a lot of NGOs practice across the length and breadth of the country and some incredibly good work uh, can then deliver that service as they've been doing. I mean, for example, Pratham Books, uh, uh, for example, does their books and that's accessible at two rupees a book and that can be distributed and their, library and their libraries and so on and so yeah. forth and I know for example especially across middle India you're talking about uh, uh, Eastern UP, uh, Bihar, uh, Chhattisgarh etc. I'll give you an example so five years ago at, um, at Jaipur this one very tall handsome gentleman in a white dhoti kurta and a pagri came up to me and he said bhai sahab mein I've come um, from a village 40 kilometers from Gorakhpur in Uttar Pradesh. And those of you who, who don't know where Gorakhpur is, it's pretty much in the boonies of, of India. It's pretty much in the heartland. And he said, I've been so fascinated by what you all have done. He went back and he set up a library. In a, he was a former teacher. He went back and he set up a library. We gave him some books to take, a, a, a village library. This year when he came back, he came back with 12 villagers. These are people who travel third class, come and stay at the railway station. Um, they live there the night, they come during the day uh, to the festival. Uh, the 12 of them, six villages now have libraries which are out of the school, run by these people, and they're both for adults as for kids. Again, I'm saying these are, this is a people movement. Uh, if we're able to enthuse people, again, I go back to what is it that we need to do? We don't have to worry about you know, creating the brick and mortar and getting the books across. What we need to do is enthuse groups of people to believe and understand and appreciate and look at the value of knowledge and learning. I'll give you an example of what happened in the UK. So London had its riots some, you know, maybe uh, eight or nine years ago. There was a big riots in London. I used to sit on the Arts Council of England's uh, advisory board on diversity. And in one of our meetings, uh, because there was this consternation in London as to how can, Lo how can third world riots come to London? And all I said is, can we do a survey where we look at the closure of community and arts centers and libraries and see where the riots happened? This wasn't necessarily rocket science stuff that I was saying. There was some protest in our group that, you know, it's going to be a waste of time, we're going to have to put out money to do it. So I said, you know, it's the only request I've made. So, you know, outside of the 20 hundred requests that people have made, so can we please do this? Three months later when the report came back, it was an exact match. And as uh, Mridula was saying, libraries are safe places. They are safe spaces for all kinds of reasons. And in creating safe spaces, what do you do? As I keep saying, um, have gun, will shoot. Have a book, hopefully will read. Your mindset is different. And this is my argument when, when uh, Trump in his first year uh, shut down the funding for the National Endowment of the Arts uh, which is their version of, you know, the uh, the the our culture ministry or whatever, 
uh, they had got together four or five people to go out and do a conversation with the Senate committee on budgets. And each of us were given 15 minutes or 20 minutes to make our presentation. And I said, I need five minutes. And this is what I said. And I went and I said, you know, ladies and gentlemen, you sell American products at the back of your American culture, driven by Hollywood, etc. So Coca-Cola and McDonald's and Ford and so on and so forth sell at the back of American culture. You take away the NEA funding, the only culture that you will be left or you'll be known for is gun culture. And if you see what's happened, you know, it continues to happen and, you know, it's a democracy and it's the strangest kind of construct ever. This is a primary problem that we look, I mean, today, this government has increased uh, the duty on the import of books by 5%. If you look at any colonial power, look at South Africa, for example, or Australia, they had the highest uh, duty applicable on books. Why? Because they didn't want people to read. They didn't want people to get Western supposed ideas of democracy and rights. This continues to be a problem. We know that in India, and I think we too have failed in many ways, or the liberal classes have failed uh, the polity at large, because we have continued to have discussions in beautiful spaces like the India Habitat Center, where three of us come together and have polite conversations. But we have failed the polity. And perhaps today I would say that we are too late in many ways. And until now, this, we start relooking at how do you access knowledge, who is this knowledge and education for? Because out there, everybody is hungry. Look at the access of phone and media and television today. It's almost at 87% of the population. If you're looking at 87% of the population who see a Nike ad on television, or Coca-Cola, or McDonald's, or whatever it is that, that, that they sell on television, then you're knowing that the length and breadth of the country is aspiring to something else. It's no more about, you know, you, this is your place. No, it's no more about that. So what is our responsibility and therefore duty of each one of us to be able to make this happen? Do we make our libraries at home or media accessible to our guards and our, and our co-workers in our homes? Do, do we do that or in our offices? to the darwan at the gate or the reception. What do we do as people to allow this access? In our parents' time, all the house help, uh, their kids were educated as a form. Do we do that today? Do we, when the house has been constructed outside in your colony road, do we even go out and look at the laborer and say, you know, it's Diwali or it's a Friday or it's a Saturday, you know, can we give you a glass of water? Or can we give you a sweep? I mean, book is a faraway thing. Do, what do we do with the kids there who are on that street? What is our responsibility as people? What is our responsibility when we see in a park street kids? I was called by the Joint Secretary of Women and Child recently uh, and said, Sanjoy, you, Salam Balak Trust is failing the city. You have these kids who are running around my park, my park in Moti Bagh. And I'm like, but, you know, have they chosen to be there? Do they choose in winter, summer, spring, whatever, to be there, out there in the street? Do they have a right to childhood? Do, and how do we as people ensure that that right gets played out? And the right to childhood and the right to education, which is enshrined today, what is it that is our responsibility? I think Mridula has talked about opening this library system. But what is it that the rest of us do? It is not about Mridula making it accessible or a literature festival making it inaccessible. It is about the responsibility and the duty of every citizen who can to make it accessible. Then you'll bring about change. Otherwise, you won't. Um. Sorry, I tend to go on a rampage, but... Uh, my wife often tells me to shut up, but she's not here today. <laughs> so, Mridula, people who are inspired by what all of you are doing at the community libraries, um, what is it to you, 
think, required, since it is about individual, that individual or collective zeal to do something, what, um, what do we, if we are inspired <coughs> by Sir Enjoy and want to go make a difference? Well, I mean, people can come and volunteer at our library. It's, we probably need money more than we need anything else. Um, you know, like the question of do we go out and give sweets to the guards at Diwali? Um, if you come Not with sweets. Not just on Diwali, but. Yeah, but it, it's, it's, you know, I grew up in that India. I grew up in the 70s in Delhi, and people did give sweets, and maybe now they don't, but I'm not really sure that we didn't end up here, um, and here is not a very good place. Mm. We didn't end up here with this kind of stratification and this kind of inegalitarianism and this kind of resultant lack of safety for all of us. We didn't end up here because we were doing good things in the 70s when we were taking care of our guards. The, the young people who come to our library, most of them are quite young. Um, very few adults come, some do. Um, some, some of our young people, our young leaders are sitting here, so all of you can wave, please. <laughs> this is our student council <laughs> from, uh, I think, from Sikandarpur uh, Branch Library and from our Sheikh Sarai Branch Library. Um, they would not want anyone to give them a, a box of sweets, and in our library we actually have a policy of not doing that sort of thing. Um, what people want is equal access. And um, yes, we want your money and we would like you to come volunteer. Um, we definitely want money. I'm looking at both of you. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> That's our student council <laughs> applauding that. S send us the bank account details. OK, I will. Um, we, 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 I, I visited uh, the, a location in South, Delhi, in South Extension today. Someone is giving us free space, a lot of free space, more, f more space than we've ever had before. Um, our little libraries that serve thousands of people are most of them around 500 square feet. Um, it's not uh, the, the luxury of being able to uh, uh, sort of um, spread ourselves and spread our legs in our libraries. It, it's really the community that makes all the difference. But the South Extension space is so um, attractive. We would love to have a bigger library and welcome more people in. The tragedy of Sheikh Sarai is every time a new person joins our library, someone leaves. Because it does get hot, it does get sweaty, it gets difficult. Above all, um, you're little and you're trying to ask someone something, ma'am, ye kya, ye kya hai, idhar, idhar kya likha hai? And if I'm answering someone else's question, if in the Head Start to Reading program where four to six year olds gather every Saturday morning to drink juice and play with teacups and make pretend tea and have friendship in a circle and have two stories read to them, um, if in that circle, um, someone is asking for something and they don't get it because someone else has now come in and asking. I, it's horrifying. We watch people leave because we can't have everyone in there. So as individual citizens, there's an incredible limitation to what we can do, the time we have at our disposal, the money we have at our disposal. What we can work on is political will and be very clear-sighted about what we're doing. Um, Clear-sighted means we cannot pretend to ourselves that this is enough, um, that th that this is you know going to be the change that uh, wh what is it that Gandhi said? Be the change you want. Um, it's good um, if you're you know on a 50-day fast maybe, um, but we're just reading aloud storybooks to children, and. The most important thing in that child's life is that we're reading that storybook. The most important thing in our nation's life is that we're really clear-sighted that what we're doing is political work. This is confrontational. This is not about friendship and getting along. Um, we do trust. We trust that we, all of us in this room, and every child who comes into the library has the capacity to be human, to be people. You know, for us in this room to be people, we need to ask our government to provide brick-and-mortar libraries 
and enough books. In some village, if someone opens a space, some people are going to be safer than they used to be, and some children are going to get to read. But always in this country, if we don't deal with how we've divided ourselves up and how the vast majority of people don't have access to their culture, you know, that thing about America and American culture, it's true for us too. We have a culture, it's made by a few people. Um, if we don't deal with that, many, many people, like that child who walks out of our library because someone else walked into Head Start for reading, um, many more people are left out or walking out. And, and because we need them, we need to do something about this. The political nature of what we do is, is about um, trusting ourselves to be better than we've been, and about confronting what hasn't worked up to now. What hasn't worked is excluding people. Um, the government has government schools. We're not short on infrastructure. We need to think smart and think hard. Um, a small room in a village um, used by you know, 400 people with 30 books in it or 55 books in it or 82 books in it, that's not enough. We have to, I mean, there are standards. The International Library Association says minimum ratio, seven to one. That means if you have a library that 10,000 people are using, you have to have 70,000 books. In our library, we have an active membership of about 1,000 plus people, a little bit over. So we have around close to 8,000 books. Um, some of the books are in the basement and they're locked up because we have to rotate them onto the shelves because there isn't enough space when you only have 50 square feet. So um, I, I, I'm not doing any of this to make nice with anyone and almost nobody who's working with me is interested in making nice anymore because we've watched people walk away hungry from the lack of access to books. We been part of pushing people out of our library because all our best practices didn't add up to enough for, in that small one square kilometer around our library, there's tens of thousands of people. All of them wanna read, every last one. That's hundreds of thousands of books and thousands of square feet we don't have. But I know that within walking distance, there are three government schools of significant size and our reform-minded Amadmi Party put out a manifesto said that they would create 400 Mohalla libraries. And in the description in their manifesto, it said basically that it would be a reading space. One of our best practices is the library is free and you can take a book home. Five days a week, you can take a book home. We're open seven days. We don't have the resources to do the sixth and the seventh day. The reading room is open all seven days. You can take a book home five days a week. So people ask me that question all the time. It's part of the ye log or padenge question. I've talked to the librarian at Sri Ram. Our loss rates are not worse than theirs. We have no security deposit. We don't have late fines. And if you're a little kid and you lost a book, and I was a little kid and I lost a book three times in one year, and they told me I couldn't use the library at school anymore. It was anyway only a once a week library and one week we had to read in Malayalam and one week in Hindi and one week in English and all the books had covers on them and the librarian chose them and put them on a table. We don't do any of that. We build the love of books. Kids who lose books are forgiven. They can come back to the library and let us know that they've lost a book or they dropped it in a ditch. And I tell them when they join the library that if lightning strikes and the book jumps out of your hand and a dog is chasing you, you still have to come to the library and help us fix something in the library. So if you're four years old, you usually come with a sibling and you usually work with your sibling for about an hour. We never ask anyone to work more than three hours. If you're a really tall teenager, you might find yourself wiping ceilings. Um, we, we, we build the library together. and. I really think that in this country we can build libraries like this. This is not about a few exceptional people. An amazing lot of people have come through our doors in the last five years. We've had in the range of around 250 volunteers. At this moment in time, we have about 45 volunteers. Volunteers have to commit to working at least a year in the library. They can't just drop in and drop out. So a lot of volunteer programs are really about just sort of showing up and looking around and leaving. We heavily rely on volunteers to produce a lot of the work. Our librarians are amazing. Most of them are themselves from working class backgrounds. One of our librarians who's in the room today 
is a former member who became a student council member, like all the student council people who waved at you, and, uh, um, and is a librarian today. There are some really excellent other programs in this country, like Parag Trust has the Library Educators course. They're working with people who are primarily Hindi speakers. They are working with people who come from backgrounds where they themselves didn't grow up reading books and who are now in a position to give books. And all the best practices, see, we didn't invent any of this. This is all widely known. None of it is a secret. If you open a book and read it to your own baby, it works, and it works when you read it to someone else's baby, too. So a read aloud every day of the week in the library. How about two, three, five? It depends on how many volunteers come in the door and how many librarians we can afford to have. Um, these best practices are widely known. There are some very good um, Tata Trust funded, um, lit fest efforts, uh, citizen bands like ours at the Community Library Project. All of us together, I think, um, do a lot to raise the question and the work we do affords us the platform to get invited to these sorts of spaces. Um, it's, a, it's a fraction of what needs to happen. The really big thing that needs to happen is we need to not listen to Google who handed out $3 million to, um, to work with India on reading. Um, and their solution is digital based. Um, we need to uh, uh, not, not listen to the World Bank when it sits down. I think it was in the Habitat Center that I came to a room and the World Bank guy was at the head of the table. And he said, I do not want one person in this room and we were all from different organizations. It was a round table of thinkers. He said, I don't want one person in this room to talk about the government. I trust the government, actually, not the present government, but I trust the idea. <laughs> we can come together, and, and we can put our money together. Um, I believe in the public good, and everyone I've met in these sorts of spaces does also. Um, Let's I don't trust any government anywhere <laughs> in the world. <laughs> Just for the record. Just <laughs> all governments, all governments have only one point agenda, which is the use of power. It's never necessarily for the greater good. I haven't seen that change, whether it's in America, Australia, Europe, Africa, uh, certainly not here. So, you know, the trust in the government. The minute you say government, today the government is deciding what you can read and what you can't. And that is true of every victorious general across the world. So the How then can we trust them? The National Endowment for the Arts in the United States, um, notwithstanding the cut to their um, budget. No, they, it wasn't they, finally. It was 115 million they got. Um, they have an amazing public library system in, in its free. And, and everyone can come in. It's been done before. It was just people like us. It can be done again. In Kerala, they did it. We can do it in Delhi. If we do it in Delhi, I mean, we're privileged. Yeah. We live in the national capital region. If we do it here, it has such a huge impact, a disproportionate impact. We are more important, each one of us, than that gentleman who so painfully took the train and came to the Jaipur Literature Festival and brought people with him. By the way, you were, and you were describing our library membership. They travel third class when they go home. They go home when someone is sick. They go home all the time. When they go home and they come back to the library, they ask, ma'am, naam to nahi kat gaye? And we say, no, welcome back. So um, I, I, I just really want to say, let's not ask for less than what we need. And uh, let's really ask powerfully, um, yeah. Does anyone have questions for either of our speakers? I just wanted to acknowledge the, uh, uh, the Mandana Sen Award for Libraries. And I don't know whether anybody is here or arrived finally from that organization. Is there? OK. But anyway, I just wanted to. They have this. Yeah. They have a new. They have an award, 50,000 50, rupees. And I must say that that's one way of being able to put I I'd actually told them to come today. and you know, talk about it, given that this was, um, because they had reached out. Sorry, go ahead. I think it's the first librarian award, and I know someone who's getting nominated for it, and she's, she's brilliant. In Golkwa Basti, there's a small library. We were somewhat part of creating it, and uh, five days a week, um, all by herself. She does multiple read-alouds, issues 
hundreds of books a week and um, there are goats wandering outside the door and uh, it's a small safe space. So a pretty amazing librarian. Okay, so any questions, anyone? Not about governments. Uh, <laughs> see, I just want to know that how do you manage to arrange resources and how do you manage to run it? Like, uh, what are your, uh, how do you manage to arrange the finances and the resources for the library and like also the accountability of the book? So for example, if you've given, if you've issued a book to somebody and I, I mean, they've lost it. So that book is lost. So and what if it's a rare book? What if book, it's books not are, in print Books anymore? are not important. Readers are important. So here's what we do. We worry when a book is lost because children are afraid to come in and tell us. So we try really, like we smile at them and smile at them and smile at them and we tell them over and over, don't be afraid of us. Uh, lately in the last two years, as we've gained traction in our community, we've asked um, children to bring their parents in when they come in for new admission. We can finally do that because they actually do bring their parents because now parents have heard about us. Earlier, they they didn't know and they didn't trust and if we had asked and required that parents come. So when parents come, we tell them that your child's book will be closed. It 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 will be closed. Like, you know, like little baby sister uh, takes a crayon all over the book. Now it can't be read anymore because key things have been um, covered up. In libraries all over the world, all kinds of children read and lose books. So this problem has been solved over and over again. It's as simple as just replace the book and help the child feel like it isn't the end of the world. Um, to humiliate yeah, a child or... Definitely, but what about those books which are not in print anymore, which are like rare and... We actually don't have rare books in our library. We're pretty focused on what's widely available and easily kept. And how do you arrange it? So how do you manage to arrange them? Um, people donate books to us and we purchase books with money that people donate to us. Vidula, okay. reach out to, uh, to Preeti and Oxford. I mean, uh, you know, like I said, the book, the libraries in very small spaces that we offer to them in our centers. They've really done a brilliant job and we're happy to make that accessible in the in the 17 odd places that we are. Plus train or work together with any of your colleagues to yes, do that. Yes, one of the things that we do do is we have developed these kinds of best practices and understanding of what they are. And we've trained at this point dozens of librarians um, and dozens of teachers in dozens of uh, you know organizations that are not our own. Um, it's all been free up to this point. So it's open sourced, it's available on our website, it's curriculum you can access. And it's easy for us to do that because we didn't invent it, we copied it from somebody else. But we did put it into practice and we learned and understood ways in which it matters to you know sort of uh, fiddle with it. Um, I, I will be asking um, you, Sanjoy, to please put us, um, because I've asked for money, and, and money is really important. Um, not as important as energy, but money is important. I've asked for money, and it's, it's hard sometimes because everybody's asking for money, and how does anyone know that our project, you know, that this is the one to support or trust. And uh, so anything you can say uh, on our behalf. Um, we've been approaching publishers. Um, Sayoni is, um, in my mind, uh, someone to emulate. So for the publishers that uh, may be here or that you know, um, Sayoni sends her books to us and not her um, raddi. She sends us the best books <laughs> and for free. And um, she sent me 60 of every title and we sent um, it to 60 libraries all over this country. At this point, we ourselves, because again, because we are in NCR, people are like giving us books that we can't use because people donate English books and we really need Hindi books. Um, so the money we get, uh, we use to purchase Hindi books. And the books that we can use, we keep. And the books that we can give to other libraries, we give to other libraries. I think we've sent out upward of 10,000 books all over the country. And we're just like a small project, you know? Um, I, I wouldn't worry about losing books. That's just like, we just have to accept that. And the reason people worry about losing books is because budget isn't allocated for it. If budget is allocated for it, it's like maybe seven, eight percent loss rate. 
every year you have to replace a certain percentage of books because they got lost and you have to replace a bigger percentage of books because a lot of people read them and now they're completely worn out. So um, there are small problems and then there are larger problems. I would uh, uh, um, describe losing books as a very small problem. Yeah, my question puts me in a little bad light. Can it be done on a commercial basis, like looking at the population, can we earn money out of a library? No, I, I don't think it's a good practice because um, that's a kind of, I mean like the really amazing public libraries in Kerala, they're free. Yeah, actually just to answer your question, well, Rila said it's not good practice to answer your question. There is a possibility and there are libraries today, especially in the favelas in Brazil, where uh, they run libraries for profit. And it came from, you know, when there used to be these video cassette libraries? So those guys changed their library model from video cassettes when it went out of fashion back to books and now to electronic tablets, etc. And they do it as a business. It's not funded. They do it as a business. and. It's a very, it's a very interesting model uh, that they and the favelas like our, um, it's like our slums. I mean, you know, and in Brazil, you either have a police-controlled favela or a, or a mob-controlled favela. So you have, you know, two different. But it it has been done, and it's a very interesting model. There are actually a lot of small libraries running in various parts of the country, but a lot of them in Delhi as well, where membership is charged and. Um, uh, I mean, they'll deliver the books home for you if you want. Yeah. I don't know whether they are making money or not, but I'm glad they exist because I, uh, somewhere it's also becoming the children of a certain social class. If they want to read a book, they just buy it, and that's you don't want them to be the only means of. But no community spaces if it's home delivered. Do schools today, ha I mean, by the very nature of being a school, do they have good libraries uh, in your experience? A lot of them do. They do. Um, a lot of them don't. But I mean, it's very librarian dependent. And sadly, are there any school librarians here? I yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, um, I used to work at Scholastic where we did work with school librarians. And uh, sadly, uh, a lot of school librarians are not given very much say in what they buy for the libraries and their primary role in, in many schools seems to be more maintaining discipline than creating a space, which is you know not a role so, that they want, it's the role that the school sees so them. Mridula, to answer your question on government and schools, uh, uh, Manish Sisodia and, uh, and his colleague. So they have now started, I mean, their whole, I don't know about the mohalla, this thing, but in the government schools, because we are ostensibly the guardians to our kids who go to the most of the government schools, and now we've been able to push the uh, governance committees to ensure that the library is actually functioning. And we supplement that by putting books which they would otherwise not have access to because it's a prescribed uh, uh, a, a number of books, or so the kind of books that you get. But we've been now donating or pushing them to get in others That's and working with hear. Pratham Books, et cetera, on that. And I have to say that the Delhi uh, government last year did a project where they invited publishers to participate in. And often when governments do these projects, it's a question of who can, um, who submits the best tender without any concern about what the books are. Uh, the Delhi government process was, as far as we could see, completely transparent. Yeah. And, and they invited, lo I mean, small publishers like us could submit. And you know, then whether or not schools bought them was the school's prerogative. But the process was transparent, reasonably. It's a, an observation about uh, not making the child feel guilty about losing a book. And that, that's very wonderful. I think it, the idea comes close to like microfinancing. Uh, we pay that money to very poor people. And even if they don't make a profit or do not return, they're not treated badly. They can again take the money and work out. We are not charging them for returning that money. It is for building that trust. 
you can come again and again and again so that you become self-sufficient. Education is something like that. Once you start getting the benefits of what you have invested, like time, energy, and also to an extent of money as well. But that strength comes from enjoying the taste of learning or building your own thoughts, finding an insight into something. Let's see that if that can take root, it can make wonders around the globe. My question is not, I want to comment on something. We have seen, I am the first one, and the most important work is in rural India. There was a lot of talk about that the children are basically taking trust, they are taking care of their children. My own experience is that the children never take care of their children, the children never take care of their children, अगर उनको लगता है कि वो इंटरेस्टिंग हैं, तो वो उसको पढ़ेंगे। अब वो इसका इंतजार करते हैं। कभी नहीं देखा गया। हम लोगों ने अभी लगभग 5,000 विलेजेस में लाइब्रेरी, कम्युनिटी लाइब्रेरी, जिसमें पेरेंट्स को इन्वॉल्व करने की कोशिश कर रहे हैं। उनको रिगुलर बेसिस पे रीडिंग मटेरियल वो जस्ट बुक तो नहीं लेकिन रीडिंग मटेरियल है जिसमें स्टोरीज हैं स्टोरीज पे डिस्कशन है वगैरह बहुत एक्टिविटी भी है वो कर रहे हैं तो बच्चे हर राउंड के लिए वो इंतजार करें कि इस बार कुछ नया आएगा और उनको जब पता चल जाता है कि कुछ नया आ रहा है तो वो उसको बहुत अच्छे से सजा करके सहयोग करके रखते हैं कि कुछ मिलने वाला है कुछ इससे सीखने वाले हैं इसी रेफरेंस में एक और चीज है कि हम लोगों ने उनको टैबलेट भी दिया ये टैबलेट देने बच्चों का जितना रिएक्शन था उससे ज्यादा जो रेजिस्टेंस था हमारे अपने लोगों का था कि सर इसको तोड़ देंगे इसको बच्चे जो है ना इसके लिए ठीक नहीं रहेगा फीडबैक जब छह महीने के बाद फीडबैक लिया गया तो पता चला कि सिर्फ थ्री फोर परसेंट जो है वो डैमेज हुआ है और अगर आप लेनोवो का डेटा देखिएगा तो ट्वेंटी सेवन परसेंट डैमेज हम बड़े लोग जो है ना करते हैं तो बच्चों पे थोड़ा सा जो है ना इसलिए मुझे लगता है कि हमें तो इस लाइब्रेरी के कॉन्सेप्ट को थोड़ा सा वाइडर करने की ज़रूरत है हमारे रूरल इंडिया में वैसे सर ने जैसे कहा है कि जो क्लोनियल कंट्रीज हैं उसमें किताबें नहीं देने की बात हो रही है किताबें नहीं देते उनके गन दे देंगे लेकिन किताबें नहीं देंगे इसलिए कि उनका अपना बेनिफिट है तो हमारे यहाँ हमारे देश में किताबों की बहुत ज़रूरत है किताबें अवेलेबल नहीं हैं टेक्स्ट बुक के नाम पे जिस तरह की चीज़ें हैं वो मिल रही हैं उसके अलावा कोई दूसरा सप्लीमेंट्री मटीरियल नहीं है कि जिससे अट्रैक्ट हो और जो प्लेजर ऑफ रीडिंग की रीडिंग ऑफ प्लेज फॉर प्लेजर की बात करते हैं वो हो ही नहीं रहा है तो मुझे लगता है कि इस पर थोड़ा सा अगर हम लोग या जो भी इस पे काम कर रहे हैं तो इसको लेकर के रूरल इंडिया की जो हालत है उसके कॉन्टेक्ट में भी काम करना चाहिए थैंक यू एक ए, एक चीज़ है जो एन नेशनल बुक ट्रस्ट और चिल्ड्रंस बुक ट्रस्ट है अगर उनके साथ जैसे प्रथम बुक्स ने कर रखा है कि खास करके अलग अलग सब्जेक्ट्स में इंटरेस्टिंग बुक्स बनाएं अनफॉर्चुनेटली समवे डाउन द लाइन बोथ दीज ऑर्गेनाइजेशन हैवन बीन एबल टू लिव अप टू दे the primary reason for them being set to, uh, to be set up and i think perhaps you know civil society needs to also demand because finally this is as you're saying can government do something in places like of course they can this should be, this should be their role that nbt and cbt etc this is what they should be doing creating the content as you're saying it's the lack of content that's become a big issue or translating the content absolutely uh, sadly there's no there is a lot of very good material which i only read english and bengali which is being created of in course. english for example and the translation into other languages is a exist. constant challenge and this in fact is something that we have spoken to nbt about numerous times or humne ek case study diya tha hamare paas ek bachcha bachcha aaya tha andhra pradesh se humne unka naam rakha tha panchi so we 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 I'll do Hindi and English. So there was a kid who came to us from Andhra Pradesh and his name was Panchi. He couldn't, he was a Mowgli, so he had been rescued from the forest. And when he came to us, he had no language except for language of the birds and, uh, and, and, and the wildlife that he was surrounded by. And he was brought to a city like Delhi and you know, to our center, our, our primary center for younger kids at, um, in, near, near the opposite the Tisa Zari Kots and which is where he lived for a while. Or, 
and he used to be always very, very angry. It was by using picture books, you know, because we were trying to understand what's the closest language that we could associate him with, because where did he come from? We didn't know at that point of time it was actually Andhra that he had come from. It was using picture books and letters, etc., etc., that we were finally able to decipher that he lived in a forest in this place uh, because of the kind of drawings that he did or uh, the images that he found in picture books. And we were able to return him to a place which was close to the forest uh, because he had this whole um, conflict in being in a city as a po because he was taken away from where he was. So, you know, we know that art therapy and literature and books works phenomenally, but we also need to drive that content and make sure that that content is appropriate. I think that's one of the big issues that, you know, one looks at. Again, in setting up the library, uh, Mridula, my first thing when Preeti had come to me from Oxford, I said, Preeti, what are you going to put in the library? Because there's not enough content and, and our kids, can't do, can't read, and it blighten or whatever, uh, you know, that whatever the flavor of the season. And we were able to work with her to develop the kind of content that we needed. It's not a lot, but it's there. I think that's... So from your experience of uh, setting up these libraries where, where kids are reading, what would you say um, is the essence of the library experience? Um, so is, it, is it that people can borrow, kids can borrow books and take it away, or can, they can just sit there and read books? What would you say yeah. is the essence of the so experience? So when I first uh, was meeting people who were coming into the library and uh, um, saying things like, uh, but how do you know they even read it? Um, so the essence, I think, is access. I really don't care if people don't read in our library. Other people I work with care a lot, and that's a very good thing. And they probably um, put a lot of energy into making sure that they're doing good read-alouds and that uh, children are finding the book that they're searching for, the one inside which you know they can see the jungle that they uh, belong the home that they came from, you know, that, that finding yourself in a book. So lots of people are working hard on lots of things. Um, all of us do agree, and for me, the primary thing is access. That um, I know that um, I buy books I don't read. Um, I have children um, surrounded by books, and sometimes they don't read. They do other stupid things instead. So uh, I do not have different standards for the members of our library. Um, I do not look at them as engaging some kind of dishonest interaction with us, like coming and taking space and a book and not reading it. I, I, I just, for me, it has always been about access, and that's the political part about our work, is, is access. The other really important thing to understand is reading is thinking. This is an old 70s, uh, I think, maybe slogan from the educators' world in, in the US. And, uh, um, if we exclude people from reading, we're excluding them from the collective thinking that goes into creating the society we're part of. Um, that pleasure, someone used the word pleasure, reading is a pleasure. Well, the pleasure is because you're thinking, not because you're making sounds that are on the page. The pleasure is because as you read, you were surprised. You thought, how could it be? You know, And then you were gladly you know, in Sanjoy's story, finding yourself in the book. Uh, how can we ever um, want to be in the society we're in right now? Be okay with it? Because we've just, you know, we're, we're poor. We're all collectively so poor. Hum garib hain, kyunki humare saath sab nahi hai. Koi hai aur koi nahi hai. Alag alag, um, you know, uh, rights and power and n the conversation that we could be having with one another through books. We've just cut ourselves off from it. Okay, just I'll two just more there. one more here, yeah. please, excuse me. Oh, I have the mic already. Excuse yeah, me, can I? Uh, go ahead. Oh yeah, sure. Sorry, I'm sorry. 
um, I just wanted to, uh, not really a question, but an observation, and I thought this uh, was something important that should be said now. Uh, first of all, it's remarkable to observe one fact that only people who have mastered the idea of creating communities without any policing, without the concept of accountability in a negative sense, can generate the confidence to ask for something as a matter of right, not as a matter of benevolence. And it is true, yes, after all, it is the republic, right? We are the public, and we are going to ask for the state to make sure that our rights as a republic are entrusted. We are not going to ask it as a benevolent thing. We are not mm. going to ask it as people. I can see in Mridulla that you know how mm. how determined she is not to sound, in a sense, uh, what we generally would call to appeal f uh, pathos, right? That one has to be sympathetic or one has to be empathetic mm. to these people. It's a matter of rights. And this is how republics are made. And it is fundamentally the point where the government comes in. Otherwise, it has no role. Other, I believe in the idea of the government. Maybe not a particular form of government. And, and that, that's basically how we have to proceed. It's a political issue by and large. We can't get away with it. Mm. And second thing is, uh, connecting the last question again, is what is the essence of uh, you know, reading? And I think, again, moving to the political issue a little further, it is fundamentally a liberal idea, meaning I have spent the better hours of my life in a library, and one thing that I've realized as a matter of essence is that I just want to be left alone. Meaning, don't put a syllabus on me, don't put a market on me, don't put a community on me. Meaning, of course, I need a community for solidarity and getting over my anxieties and all that. But eventually, what I want is a space where I can discover my individuality. And that is the idea of liberal politics in the core of it. So eventually, we'll have to ask for the republic to entrust our constitution. That's exactly what our project is, and we're all up for it. Thank you. You need to demand your right, not just ask for it, to demand it. Absolutely, by asking. But, but I'm going to demand it from the state, and of I course. construct the state. I can't say so. that I'm not going to trust the state. It, state is me. I'm not like away from the state. Hi, um, I'm trying to build more perspective on uh, starting a community library. Uh, so a couple of questions. Uh, first is uh, when we speak of this whole idea of it's a community library, uh, and uh, you said that uh, the number of adults visiting uh, as a ratio with uh, say younger people, teenagers or children is very less. So I would just like to know uh, who are these adults and why do they come and what do they read? If you can throw some light on that. Second, uh, you highlighted on uh, something, uh, you know, uh, when, when you were talking about the Google uh, grant, you were talking about, how, uh, I mean, I could sense a, a sense of uh, an against digital. Uh, so I wanted to know more why, why that. And third, uh, can community libraries also play an important role in developing scientific temper? Uh, who are the adults and uh, so sometimes adults are um, coming in because they're literate and they want to read and it's an opportunity to read so we have a, um, a elderly woman who comes to read the newspaper almost every day um, we have most of the time adults coming into the library because they're parents of children who are already in the library so it's as part of this like family engagement um, maybe the child took the book home and read it to the mother, and now the mother is thinking about coming and getting a book for herself. Um, adults have come in to ask if we can teach them to read, and we don't know how to do that, so we haven't tried to do that. But that's probably an essential part of any library in India, is that it has to tackle the question of literacy. We know from the literacy movement in Kerala that um, libraries preceded literacy, um, the, the big achievement of 100% literacy, the that there was a library movement and then there was a literacy movement. It's not the other way around. You don't have a literacy mm -hmm. movement and then you create libraries to meet the need of people who know how to read. So that's the picture with adults. Um, we also have adults in the library because we do cultural programming like a visiting poet. You don't need to know how to read to experience literature. If someone is reading it to you, um, if, you know, appropriate to adults. NBT does an amazing job of um, publishing books for adults who are um, whose literacy level is not very high. So there are great stories 
um, by people like Manto, um, just one story in one leaflet-like book. That was the first question. Your second question was digital. Um, I believe that um, digital information is something everyone should have access to, like um, information in books, um, information that's available digitally, um, same access. In our libraries, we provide free internet access and laptops to all our members. So um, whether the child is hanging out on YouTube or or playing games is, uh, it's the same thing that everyone else has to deal with when they are faced with the World Wide Web. You have to figure out how to navigate it and how to make choices, and our members are encouraged to navigate it and make choices. They usually choose YouTube. I don't know anything about scientific temperament. Okay. So one last question, yes. yes sir. Uh, change the library to something else. They are not uh, having any concept of library now. Second thing is that we have so many elite, so-called elite libraries, and almost they are empty. Nobody sitting, whole day AC, light, and everything is being misused. So why not to make use for other people? Why to make a very elitist life? And thirdly, if you go to any government library every day, they will ask you why you are coming here every day. You don't have any work to do. So it's a very strange thing. They feel uncomfortable if you are going every day. And they, what he, recently uh, I used to go to, there's a new a medical center near Meridian Hotel. It was empty. They asked me to bring your friends. Now there's a crowd. Now they have withdrawn sofas, chairs, everything. And they have withdrawn <laughs> computer also. They say, no, it's computer is not for the public. It's only for us. So what is this strange things are happening? Thank you all very much. Sachin, I can see your idea of engagements around libraries has provoked a lot of discussion. So we do hope that this series will continue and we do hope that you will come again. Mridula, Shanjay, thank you both very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I really want to uh, share our very sincere thanks to Mridula and Sanjoy and Sayoni for making time, for understanding, for responding to our requests with such intensity and sincerity. Thank you very much and thanks all uh, thank, thank you all for making time for this session. If you leave your emails with us, we'll reach out to you with more interesting programs and other openings, uh, you know, thrown open by this discussion. Thank you very much. The, there is a sheet outside. Please leave your emails. <laughs>